Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Welcome, listeners, to Fortress on a Hill. We have a, uh, a great episode for you today. Uh, this is the uh, one of the first times in quite a long time that it's been just me and Danny sitting here having a discussion about the issues, and I'm, I'm excited for that. Um, Danny, I, I've really enjoyed um, your recent series on uh, Lebanon, the one of the first subject for us to discuss today, and uh, I would really, would, would really like it. Can you expand upon what's happened there and a bit on the history of Lebanon as it pertains to America. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a Lebanon geek, uh, which doesn't surprise you and probably half our listeners. I'm sure some people are like, aren't you a geek about everything? And there's some truth in that. Uh, I, I always had kind of like a romantic attachment to the Lebanese civil war. Uh, I started reading when I was pretty young and following the news. And, you know, of course, when we were like, you know, young, when I think I was seven or so, when the, the 1976 to or 1975 to, to 1990 major Lebanese civil war that killed like 150,000 people, which in a country at the time, which had less than 4 million people is like unbelievable, right? Tens of millions of Americans, uh, the equivalent of, you know, or at least several million. So uh, I, I remembered the civil war and it's kind of reporting on the out you know, the, the, on the backside in the 90s when no one was sure if it was really going to hold. Uh, like you, I, I remembered how Beirut was like a moniker, right? Like a cultural touchstone for chaos, especially urban chaos in, in all society. You know, and so, of course, like my Wu-Tang rappers, as I always mentioned, talked about it all the time, but so did a ton of other artists, and it was in lots of movies, and it was just a language, right? People would just say, like, oh, man, it's like Beirut if you go to the Bronx, you know, or if you go to down south side Chicago, that's like Beirut, you know, and so this was like a very powerful thing, and I think another reason it interested me is because I had a family that was, you know, vaguely supportive of the IRA quote unquote terrorists. Uh, and so were like most of the people I grew up with. Um, and so that was interesting in the sense that I think, you know, most Midwest Americans, right, or just most Americans in general who, who didn't come from sort of a or, or an ethnic framework, uh, it was it went without saying that a group like the IRA, the Irish Republican Army was terrorist because, you know, our government essentially said they were, the British said they were, uh, and that was just policy. Uh, of course, I came up in culture that wasn't the case. Like they were considered freedom fighters. The reality is much more complicated than either of those things. But I was interested in sort of ur urban insurgency, uh, civil wars. Um, you know, Beirut and Belfast had uh, very similar inflections in our language at the time, right? Both were considered very dangerous urban places. And I think the fact that Lebanon had this Christian community, I'm a little embarrassed to say, right? Because there were Christian militias, I mean, who wore crosses around their neck holding AK-47s on corners, teenagers that looked more like, you know, Arab Crips and Bloods uh, than they did like uh, soldiers in uniform or, or anything like that. Those images and the fact that they were, uh, just the fact that there were Christians in the Middle East fighting for what I think at the time I probably perceived was like their freedom to some extent or their, 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 their survival uh, in my childish sort of romanticized, westernized, Eurocentric view, that was appealing. It interested me because really Lebanon was the only, at least in my mind and, and largely true, the only country with a significant, right, almost or approaching 50% at the beginning of the civil war, uh, 
minority, right, or portion of the population. So Lebanon's interesting to me from the start. And uh, I'd always kind of read about it, and but not very sophisticated, not very like academic or scholastic works uh, until Iraq, interestingly enough. And so the, the final thing that gets me interested in Lebanon, and that really sets me off on a path where starting in late 2006 until now, you know, uh, I, I've probably read, you know, two or three dozen books on modern Lebanon, right? Or just Lebanon in general, especially modern Lebanon. And it was kicked off with me reading Robert Fisk's book, Pity the Nation, uh, which he wrote, I believe, right in 1990. It was an award-winning book, a British uh, journalist who had lived in Beirut, still lives in Beirut, I believe, writes for The Independent. But he had written kind of the book, right? The first-hand, first cut at history, like all good journalism, uh, account of the Civil War, Pity the Nation. And uh, why did I read that in Iraq? I mean, well, first of all, I was reading pretty much anything I can get my hands on in the Middle East. But I think the real reason is because I was working in Shia East Baghdad. And uh, I had sort of like fallen in love with my interpreter, Rakil, who I've talked about a lot in the book and on podcasts and radio. He's still my friend. Uh, he lives in Queens. He comes to Christmas at my family's house, even if I'm not there every year. But he's Shia, Sadr City. And so between the fact that I work with these Shia communities largely uh, in East Baghdad, largely Shia, uh, and, and sort of gathered like an affinity for them and their sort of like martyrdom victim culture that they have from being the minority for, you know, 1400 years in the Middle East and watching their kind of rise after the American invasion, uh, because they are the majority in Iraq. And so you had this like impoverished, put upon Shia rising. And then I remember Akil saying to me, you know, you guys don't like Muqtad al-Sadr. And like, he didn't really like him either. He wasn't really into the Mahdi army militia. I mean, in fact, they threatened his life uh, for working with the Americans or suspecting that he did. Uh, but at the same time, family members of his did like the Sadr militia, many people in his community, which was named after Sadr's, you know, grandfather, uh, you know, obviously were, were very connected. And so I got connected to the Shia and then Akil said like, well, listen, like the Sadr family has connections that run like all the way to Lebanon through this guy, Musa Sadr, uh, who is distant cousin of Muqtada, uh, El Sadr, who was the militia leader of the Mahdi army in Iraq. But uh, his distant cousin and, and elder was this like Grand Ayatollah, right? Who had legit like had the chops in terms of, the, you know, theology and divinity degrees or the equivalent of, whereas Muqtada didn't really, you know, that's what they called him, you know, Mullah Atari, because when he was a kid, he played, they, in other words, the Muslim faithful, the Shia faithful made fun of this kid because he was kind of like a Kennedy, but he was kind of like one of the lower Kennedys, you know what I mean? Who like, the kind that like die in skiing accidents, not the kind that become president, right? Well, that was dark, guys. I understand that, but it was fucking funny. But anyway, he was kind of like that at first. Like no one thought he was going to rise. He was just like a spoiled kind of kid of a famous family. And he played video games like in the 1980s. And that was kind of weird and rare and showed some privilege and modernization and also not to be taken seriously. So they called him Mula Atari. Of course, joke was sort of on the people who had laughed at him because he was kind of very much like, I'll show you someday, you know? Uh, and uh, he became this militia leader after the American invasion, sort of empowered him with the Shia disenfranchised in the, in the urban ghettos. But his distant cousin and elder was Musa Sadr, who was actually a serious Ayatollah, studied in Najaf and all that, and calm in uh, Iran. And he actually formed something in the in the 1970s, uh, early 70s, I believe, right before the Civil War, uh, called the Movement of the Dispossessed. And the idea was that he had gone to southern Lebanon, which is vast majority Shia. Shia are the largest growing community in Lebanon then and now. They're probably the large, they're, they're the plurality, right? They're the biggest group. Uh, and yet they had always been the most disenfranchised. They lived in like rural, feudal, uh, literally like sort of like feudal system uh, where they were controlled by their own landlords who were from their community, but the vast majority were very poor. They, they had the least representation in parliament, despite being the growing and probably by then already the largest community in Lebanon's multifaceted 18 confessional state, uh, 18 officially recognized by the state confessions, mostly Christian, but they, he kind of forms this and he's not a particularly violent man. Uh, and he's and he's not like a super militant dude, but he 
wants to rise the, uh, the the rural Shia of southern Lebanon in particular, and also the Bekaa Valley, which is in the northeast of the country, which is the two main areas that the Shia lived. But, you know, what was interesting is that the civil war breaks out for a number of reasons, and we'll get into that at some point. But in 1975, the civil war breaks out. So now this movement of the dispossessed forms the Islamist resistance regiments, like, because every community in Lebanon armed itself and formed a militia. Some already existed, some formed as a result of this of war. So this movement of the dispossessed forms the resistance regiments, which are sort of the Shia version of the militia, and the acronym, which uh, means hope in Arabic, is Amal, A-M-A-L. And so Amal is kind of the outgrowth of this Musa Sadr movement of the dispossessed and becomes one of the most powerful uh, militias. And then after the Civil War becomes a political party. In fact, it's still one of the most important political parties. It's the alternative to Hezbollah uh, within the Shia community. And the speaker of the parliament, who must be a Shia by the rules of Lebanon's state, which we'll get into, uh, is Nabi Berry who is from the Amal party and has been the speaker since 1992. Imagine that, 28 years, right? Pelosi, wow. you've got a, you got a while to catch up, Nancy. I know you want that. She wants that. She wants that. She may as well run a militia. She could be as corrupt as Amal, but she's not there yet. Uh, anyway, he has been the, the speaker, and he was uh, an acquaintance of Musa Sadr and took over the movement after his, uh, after his uh, disappearance. They call him the vanishing Imam because uh, he had pissed off Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran. He didn't totally agree with him, even though they knew each other and they sort of respected each other. Uh, he did not believe that uh, Shia Islam should form the basis of all politics. He didn't really believe in that new doctrine promulgated by uh, Ayatollah Khomeini. And there was, so no one knows exactly what happened, except to say what we know is that Musa Sadr, Muqtada al-Sadr from Iraq, remember his distant elder cousin, uh, went to see Gaddafi in Libya. I mean, you can't make this shit up. I love the Middle East. It is a mafia soap opera. It is like Dallas meets Goodfellas or Dynasty, right? Or something like that. Uh, it's beautiful. But anyway, he goes to see Gaddafi. I can't even remember why. And uh, there's a lot of conflicting accounts of what happens, but he gets into an argument. This much has been documented by witnesses. He gets into an argument about like Shia theology or just Muslim theology because Gaddafi is a Sunni uh, at his court. And like, you don't fuck with Gaddafi at his court, right? He's got like Amazon female bodyguards. I mean, literally, he's a weird dude, right? And so that happens. And all we know is that he's never seen again. Uh, the vanishing imam, they call him. And stays popular to this day. His picture is all over Lebanon even now, not as much as the Hezbollah leader, Hassan Nasrallah, any longer, who that movement, which we'll get to, kind of uh, elevated itself even more among the Shia than Amal for a number of reasons. But Musa Sadr's picture is still everywhere. Amal still holds him up. Even the Hezbollah people very much respect him. And then Akil pointed out to me a picture of Musa Sadr, and then I saw several in East Baghdad, right? And so I'm like, holy shit, no one knows this. And I mean, it, it struck me that, oh my God, the, the generals running this war don't understand the nature of like this like region-wide Shia uprising and like why it has real grievance and how complicated it is. So I started reading about Lebanon, I never stopped. And then on August 4th of uh, 2020, just this uh, earlier this month or uh, when, we're, when this is released last month, there's this massive blast at the port of Beirut, and it, it appears there was an accidental explosion of 2,750 uh, tons of ammonium nitrate, right, which is highly explosive, used in bombs sometimes. And uh, it had been left for several years unattended, unsafely in a warehouse on the waterfront of the Mediterranean. I mean, it's incredible. And uh, it ignites, and I think it's about 200 are dead, 300,000 homeless, 65 ish, 100 wounded, and like maybe $15 million worth of damage in a country that's only got about, you know, what, uh, uh, four and a half million citizens plus two million refugees, which we'll also get to. And uh, small country, a lot of death. It's there 9 11. And, um, and yet it was accidental, which was almost worse. For a country that's been bombed by Israel so many times and other people, uh, the assumption of many people when the explosion happened is, oh, Israel's bombing us again. And we'll get to that. 
That's what they assumed. I mean, there's so many reports where everyone was like, and then they say, these civilians, they're like, it would be better. We wish it was Israel bombing us. Because then at least we'd know who to be mad at. But the reality is it was the corruption and the venality and just the ineffectiveness and incompetence of a system. And this is where I'll kind of end it before we move into some of the myths and misunderstandings. But uh, the system that is in place in Lebanon, put there by the French, as another thank you to Britain and France. Like, find me a problem in the world. Find me a problem area of the world where the British or the French didn't create it with a pencil, right? Or a pen when they should have used the pencil, right? And a map. Like some like stuffy dude named Michelle and some stuffy new dude named Winston totally sat around like with like French wine and like a, a cigar and made these problems, but it's true. And so France creates the system. And anyway, the bottom line is it's a quota system. It is a certain number of seeds for each confession each type of Christian, each type of Muslim, right? And then some of the weird groups like the Druze, which are like vaguely Muslim. Anyway, these people serve, they're in their jobs, not for their competence, but because of their religion. And so what they really are is a spoil system of like mafia family leaders. And oh, by the way, as I'll talk, there are six families that run Lebanon, essentially. Six, six families like that, that represent the different factions or factions within the factions. And so after the Civil War, the negotiation was that, yes, 150,000 people died from 75 to 90 fighting for power and which group's going to be king. And this, the tragedy or the tragic comedy of it is that a minor compromise was made and essentially the status quo reigned. And so the old French system of divvying it up via like the ultimate affirmative action quota system, except it wasn't affirmative anyway, if it was affirmative action, it was to favor the Christians actually. But nevertheless, this quota system created an inherently corrupt mafia-like state that literally can't keep the lights on in one of the most modern educated societies in the Middle East. And then of course, overlooked this total ridiculous and unsafe you know, violation of having this explosion there. So the port blows up. And the reason I wrote about the myths that we'll talk about next is I watched in wonder as the supposed experts on Lebanon writing for all these major publications in America and across the West, the people that they have stationed in Beirut to the extent that there are any foreign bureaus left, bureaus left, there's only a few papers that still do it, but the supposed experts on the Middle East or even Lebanon specifically, if you, I started reading their reporting and I'm just a lay, a person of lay interest, but pretty significant lay interest. And I was blown away by a couple of things. A, totally just got the facts wrong about Lebanon. Uh, B, uh, completely m abused the facts they did have in order to fit a certain Western-centric analysis that made it about us and see, uh, used it opportunistically to essentially make it about Iran being bad and about Hezbollah being bad on Iran's behalf and threatening our favorite little brother, troublemaker Israel. And so the crisis of the Lebanese uh, was twisted. And as always, the narcissist in chief, Uncle Sam, sort of said, oh, it's really about us. And so then I said, after I wrote an initial long column about Lebanon, I thought to myself, unless we, e unless we even tell the truth about the place, uh, there's no sense in even trying to solve any of the problems to the extent that there are to solve. So with that very long intro, that's why I was interested in Lebanon, and that's why I decided to write the top 10 myths of Lebanon. I probably could have done 20, but, I mean, we all know you have to keep it to 10. That's the rules. I don't make them. Yeah, 10 sounds important. 10 sounds official, like George Carlin says. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated by the fact that they have allowed so many refugees into their country. Um you know, the, the, we, we can't even manage to get, you know, a, a measly 50,000 here, and they have two and a half million uh, people with all kinds of all kinds of connections to them there. I just think that that's very, uh, that's very human. It's very, uh, it's powerful. Um, In one sense, you could say that Lebanon is a refugee nation. I mean, it always has been, uh, ever since the Palestinians were, you know, booted out 
ethnic cleansing style in 1948 and 49 by the uh, Israeli militias come army. Um, they've always had a higher, today they have the highest per capita refugee population in the world, um, but they've always had a very high rate. And first it was Palestinians and now it's Syrians. Uh, and you're right. I mean, uh, it's, it's approaching 35 to 40 percent of their population that is actually not Lebanese citizens because it's very hard to become a Lebanese citizen. citizen. So these refugees are permanent underclass. So it's nice that they're there. And obviously, although I don't know that the Lebanese state has that much control of their own borders to stop it, but, um, but they also don't get citizenship because there's a patrilineal system where your father has to be uh, born in Lebanon. But Hmm. the bottom line is, so just being born there, like the refugee kids that are born in Lebanon, unlike America, which is rare, America's rare, 14th Amendment, being born here makes you a citizen. That's actually not typical. It's not always the case. Uh, so anyway, it's hard to be a citizen, but we have a situation there where 35 to 40 percent of the people who live in Lebanon, the residents, aren't Lebanese, right? They're either Palestinian refugees, some of them who've been in Lebanon for two generations, uh, or more of them are these new Syrian ones. But it's important to remember, last point, sorry to cut you off, but important to remember, the Palestinian refugee infusion of the late 60s, early 70s is not the cause, not the, not the long-term cause of the civil war that kicked off in 75, but it was the catalyst. And so I just think that's important to keep in mind when you have a refugee nation where now currently 50% or more of the school age children are not Lebanese, right? Because they have children at a higher rate. The refugees do or more children. Uh, they're, that's a dangerous situation, especially given that the last time that a new refugee infusion came in and destabilized the very tenuous confessional balance between Sunni, Shia, Christian, uh, the last time that happened, there was a civil war that killed the equivalent of several million Americans. So this Syrian infusion is very dangerous. So let's, uh, let's move on to these myths that you, uh, you wrote about here. Um, number one. Lebanon is the target and part of Iran's anti-American Shia crescent. Yeah, I, I put that first on purpose. Um, the crux of most reporting after the blast, because we are a callous and self-centered bunch here in the West. It's like, how can we make this about us? You know, how can we talk about Lebanon without including any Lebanese? Um, well, one way to do that is to make Iran the puppet master of every problem. And so there, uh, Vali Nasser, who's uh, like a real scholar, uh, and, and his conclusions were a lot more nuanced than the policymakers who hijacked it. But there's a book written, I think, when we were in Iraq, or the, when, uh, when I was in Iraq in 06, 07, so like when we're around our time that we were in the tours, right? I think that's when he published it, and it was called The Shia Crescent. Uh, now, The Shia Crescent uh concept was actually from the king of jordan a little bit before i believe in 2004 and what he said was that the king of jordan big ally of america one of only two arab states up till then although the uae just did but up till then one of only two arab states to officially like recognize and make peace with israel which it did in 94 10 years later in 04 right after the american invasion uh so what did the american invasion of iraq do well it it kind of let the, the the shia genie out of the bottle uh, to steal a phrase from uh, Yitzhak Rabin, uh, the Israeli prime minister, who actually said that about Lebanon. He said that Israeli military policy was stupid, uh, even though he was complicit in much of it earlier. He said, like, we screwed up, basically. And uh, and we, let the, we ended up letting the Shia genie out of the bottle. In other words, we stirred up these previously quietist Shia and turn them into enemies unnecessarily. Well, what happened when the Americans invaded, when we, you and I, right, like we're part of the, uh, the, the, the follow on towards that invasion, you know, three is that we took a state where the Shia were the largest group, but had been suppressed by Saddam, which was a Sunni led sort of secular, but Sunni led and dominated tribal uh, government for many years. Uh, actually, ever since the British took it over, it had been Sunni led. Uh, they the Shia suddenly had a lot of weight because if we're going to have a democracy, now suddenly the Shia are going to be the most powerful force. And the Shia sit on most of the oil along with the Kurds in the north, but I think most of it's with the Shia. And the... So anyway, the bottom line is the Shia suddenly were in power. And now the idea was that because the Shia are in power, or that means that Iran, which is also Shia right next door, secretly is going to take over all of Iraq. 
And now it is true that the American invasion of Iraq was a gift to the Iranians in the sense that it did ensure that they would have more influence in Iraq, but it missed this fact that actually Iraqi Shia have a lot of loyalty despite the fabrication of the country in many ways a, a generation before or 100 years before they have a uh, iraqi nationalist uh, loyalty and they also have an arab ethnic loyalty because the iranians despite being co-religionists are persians so this was the myth and so the idea was the shia crescent is oh my god like I, iran from tehran the evil ayatollahs the new hitlers uh, they are literally pointing a crescent-shaped sort of dagger that looks a whole lot like the crescent moon of Islam. Oh, man, these are clever folks. These are clever, clever folks who don't know anything about the Middle East. Uh, they said there's this dagger that it goes through Iraq, so it goes from Tehran. It goes northwest through Iraq, through Syria, because Syria is kind of allied, and now it's very allied, but it had always been tacitly allied with Iran. And the idea is, oh, she is all, the, Syria is also a Shia state. Well, not really. It's run by an Alawite uh, uh, minority, which is only like 10 or 15% of the population, but that Assad family comes from it. And they're vaguely Shia, but the majority of Syria is Sunni, and they're not exactly Shia. And in fact, some Shia don't even think they're Muslim. But nevertheless, so it goes through Iraq into Syria. And where does it end? Right on the Mediterranean, pointing right at the heart of Europe, Right the expansionist Iranian Shia, because southern Lebanon, South Beirut, where the refugees from the wars in southern Lebanon, Shia moved, and then the Bekaa Valley in the northeast. So Iran is putting its tentacles into all the way to Lebanon and through its proxy militia, Hezbollah, formed in about 1982, give or take. So this is the myth. Uh, what I talk about here is that while Iran and Hezbollah do have a connection, a serious one, especially at the outset, that Hezbollah, right, this this organization that was formed to resist the Israeli invasions of Lebanon, which started in 1978, officially, although there have been border incursions for that, but starts in 78 with Operation Latani and doesn't end until Israel leaves in 2000, leaves its, its occupation of the southern part of Lebanon. So we're talking about 22 years. And then, of course, Israel has invaded since then. There was a big war in 2006, and they occasionally bomb, just like they did this last week. So uh, Hezbollah is, is, a, is a more radical but grassroots and, uh, and organic, largely. No one wants to admit that. Uh, Shia resistance movement, like Amal, although it's a competitor with Amal, uh, and it uh, fights the Israelis and also fought the Americans uh, when we came into Beirut, which we'll talk about in the next myths, uh, in 1983. So... My point in the myth is to show you that, you know, A, these Shia supposedly Shia countries aren't all that linked. Like there's some linkage, but there's a lot of diverse diversity and they don't always get along. Uh, I also talked about how the Shia, even within Lebanon, are divided against each other. They literally fought a war from like 88 to 89 or something. And it was called the War of the Brothers, right? It's a Mal versus Hezbollah. And so my point was, look, there's a lot of gradation. What we have here with the Shia Crescent is we have Americans and other Westerners, especially the Israelis who kind of push this, uh, this idea that Iran is pulling all the strings and that Shia are a monolith. And that's just not true. And that, that, that's myth number one is that Iran runs the show. Well, Hezbollah is popular, and we'll get to that. Hezbollah is popular in Lebanon for reasons that are outside of Iran that have to do with real grievance and the services they provide. Not simply being an easy target for American defense policies. Exactly, right. Hezbollah is not about us, right? It's not all about us. It's always about us, Danny. I mean, come on, we're Americans. Clearly, yeah, no, absolutely. All right. Uh, myth number two. Lebanon was slash is the last bastion of Christendom, a Christian state in the Middle East or the Mideast, excuse me. Yeah, I, I think this is important and why I first got involved with Lebanon. Uh, for a long time, Westerners, especially European, especially French, 
were obsessed with this idea that there was like an Eastern authentic Christianity. Um, ever since the Muslims, you know, came out of the Arabian Peninsula and conquered the Holy Land, you know, in the seventh century, there's been this like regret, you know, that the land that our savior, Jesus Christ grew up in, isn't even under Christian control anymore. I mean, that was a serious blow to a only recently fallen Roman Empire and its eastern component, the Byzantines. So there always were a lot of Christians in what was called Mount Lebanon. See, Lebanon as it exists now is really that that name is just a mountain and it's Enverons, right? It's in the north, sort of the north and west of the country. And uh, that had, the, the Christians kind of held out there. Uh, largely because the mountain setting was difficult to conquer and also because they collaborated, right? They just, they made nice sort of. And the myth is that the Muslims forced everyone to convert at the sword when actually uh, all throughout the Middle Ages and before, the, the Muslims were the far more tolerant. There can be no compulsion in the religion, right? Said, says the Quran. Uh, and for a long time, Islam was far more tolerant than the Christians, who were way more backward in art, science, everything, until, you know, around uh, the age of sale, right? The age of discovery, as we call it, the, you know, 16th-ish century. So the reason that matters is that the myths are as follows. One, Lebanon is majority Christian. Not true, right? Uh, Mount Lebanon, that small little Maronite kingdom, Maronites are one form of christianity that uh is tied to the catholic church uh and is what the majority of the christians are but there's all kinds of christians greek orthodox catholic all this is but uh that little area was always majority christian but when the french created a lebanon to be a separate state when they literally fabricated it uh and they did it to have a home for the christians so it's like israel before israel it's like a, it's like a test case for israel right like a homeland for the christians but in order to do that they had the same problem the israelis had which is to make it a viable state that had like ports and like enough people and like enough farmland and stuff uh they had to like draw the map to like capture in a bunch of shia druze which is that weird little half christian half Muslim, half secretive, half whatever, uh, syncretic religion, and then and Sunni Shia. Uh, they had to capture these people inside the state. And so the same problem the Christians have is the same problem the Jews had in 1948, which is like, well, what are we going to do with all these non-Jews? If it's going to be a Jewish state, if it's going to be an ethnocracy rather than a democracy, the elephant in the room is the Palestinians and their humanity or lack thereof, depending on your point of view. So that was the same problem with the Christians, right, in 1920 when France forms this country. So they, they, they captured in, like, so even from the start, the Christians were, like, at best half. And then there was this myth that the Christians were the majority. And so the rule of thumb, actually it was in the Constitution, I believe, is that uh, in Parliament uh, there had to be six seats for a uh, Christian for every five seats Muslim. And that meant all the different Muslims and the Druze, who aren't even fully Muslim. And that was the basis for their constitution and it's all based on a very dubious official census in 1932 uh which was the last time they've done a census because lebanese are afraid of themselves and afraid of each other and they their government won't have another census they still have it because the dirty little secret but the funny thing is everybody knows it just like every other secret everybody knows who's cheating on them that's how this works right secrets aren't secrets we all secretly know what's going on well the lebanese have known for a long time just by looking around and counting people that actually the muslims have been the majority for a long long time and it's getting worse and worse and so uh we romanticize lebanon as christian lebanon despite the fact that it has not been ever really majority Christian, and certainly not a six to five majority. Uh, the Economist, I mean, you, ha you cannot make this shit up. The Economist published, uh, and you can read it, <laughs> a mistakenly posted voter roll, okay, because it's all secretive. You know how like here we have like a census and you're allowed to see it? I mean, it's all messed up and it like, you know, disenfranchises people of color, but it's, it's close and it's real and it's public. You can go to a website and check it out. There, everything's secretive. So their interior ministry, some idiot bureaucrat 
by mistake, published the truth of the voter rolls on their website. The Economist found it, published it in an article. Uh, the Interior Ministry immediately pulled it down and denied that it was true, but The Economist had it, right? They probably like screenshotted it. You know, they had it forever. Uh, and so same reason, don't let your kids send dick pics to their girlfriends. Bad idea, even worse on the other end. But same thing, right? So the this truth is that, oh, my God, the Christians are actually like 33-ish percent at best, 33 to 37%. Uh, and yet their constitution or the settlement that ended the Civil War, uh, I told you, was a very minor change. So 150,000 people died from 1975 to 1990. And this is the only change that came out of it in the compromise. Six to five in parliament, Christian versus everybody else. Now it's five to five or one to one. That was what all those people died for. It's a tragedy. But what we found out and everyone already knew is that it's actually more like seven to three is what it should be, right? Various Muslims to Christians. So that's the thing. Um, but a lot of this is driven by romanticization of this Eastern Christianity uh, European intervention begins with the Crusades, of course, in like 1097 or 1098, when um, the, the the Franks, right, the most powerful of the Christian groups, Franks, French, right, uh, the knights come and they take the Holy Land and they murder, they massacre every Muslim and Jew. That's fun inside Jerusalem's walls. Uh, and what happens is they find that there are Christians in what's today's Lebanon and they sort of collaborate with them and they empower them. And uh, so then, you know, eventually in 1291, all the Christians, the last crusader kingdom is pushed out right at Acre. Uh, and, um, and that's in Northern Israel right now, but that that's pushed, they're pushed out and they go back to Muslim rule, like forever, ever since the region does. And these, Maronites, these Christians in Lebanon, they sort of like push this idea to the West that, oh, we might even be descended from all your crusader knights, right? You should protect us from these evil Muslims that we live under. And then, of course, DNA tests have been done, and they're like, that's not true at all. Like, that's not who you are. But it was a very helpful myth. And so starting in 1860, for the first time in the modern era, France starts intervening militarily whenever there's like an ethnic or confessional religious civil war in Lebanon. And so they sort of send their army in to take sides with the Christians and protect the Christians from massacre or just general civil war. And ever since then, for the first, you know, from for the first hundred years from 1860 until 1958, it was the French that were always backing up. The, the Christians and propping up their power above their actual demographic weight. And then in 1958, because France is kind of like their empire is falling apart. They don't have the power or the will. Eisenhower's first military intervention in the Middle East, which was the first since the Barbary Wars for the United States, meaning the first since 1815, is in Lebanon, again, to prop up a Christian president. Then starting in the late 70s and early 80s, it's the, it's the Israelis who fall for this myth, this delusion that there's a Christian alternative in the Middle East and it lives in Lebanon. And they invade Lebanon and literally try to impose a Christian president who – the president's always Christian by the Constitution – but a Christian president who would have extra power and work directly for them. Right was going to be their proxy, and his name was, uh, uh, you know, Bash Bashir Gamal, right? And uh, and he's from one of the six families, the Gamal family, and they still run a sixth of Lebanon. But uh, they try to put him in power, and of course, this makes the civil war worse. And so everyone's fallen for this delusion of a Christian alternative. It's not true, and it's actually uh, it's it's induced and accelerated civil war. So that's a I'm going to start shortening these answers, but I think that's super important to understand that I think if there's one uh, last thing, if there's one fact that should deflate the myth of a pro Western Christian alternative in Lebanon, it's not even that they're only 30 to 35 percent of the population. It's this the current president and the largest of the two major Christian political blocs is currently, and for 15 years now-ish, has been in an alliance, a ruling coalition political alliance with whom? Hezbollah, Amal, and the rest of the Shia. So sorry, romanticizers, nostalgizers for an Eastern Christianity. The Christians in Lebanon are complicated. 
they fight each other, they're Arabs, okay? And in this case, recently, they actually are allied with Hezbollah. That's fascinating. Uh, uh, and it's, 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 I'm sure it's even worse for you, Danny, but just the, the, the comparisons back to other things that we've talked about and we've studied and just how, how much ignorance is shoved into our defense strategies that there's none of this is examined none of this is you know whether like like you just said the largest christian faction in the country is aligned with hezbollah how in the world anybody could take that that there's a pro-western christian state just waiting to be born or something nah nah that's bullshit another dirty little secret for all the Americans out there, the people making your policy and throwing our power and literal bombs around the world, most of them, they know no things. That's how many things they know. They know no things about the things that they're in charge of. I mean, and I'm, I'm exaggerating purposely, hyperbolically, but it's not untrue because forget about the fact that Donald Trump doesn't know any of this. The smartest people supposedly in the Biden cabinet in waiting – they don't even really know most of this stuff. And guys, it's not that hard to learn. Read, I could, three books. Read Pity the Nation by Robert Fisk. Read Beware of Small States, you know, by uh, David Hurst. Just read those two books and like, you'll know more than 90% of the policymakers who work on the Middle East. The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us but we can't do all the work we need you to share an episode of ours with someone anyone who you like might think might be affected by it young people looking to join the military or parents advocating for one conscientious citizens who care about the violence the u.s wages in their name advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for females and minorities and inflicts on minorities around the globe and anyone else you think it might affect please take a moment pause the episode share this with them now our podcast is supported in a few different ways first there's patreon where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and i pay for some of the podcast's expenses those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to, uh, to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So, let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, James Zobar, Adam Bellows, Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P., Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, Tristan Oliver, Marwan Marwan, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can always contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Forge Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com. Make sure you check for promo codes before you order. And now, let's get back to the podcast. All right. Uh, myth number three, part of Lebanon's current problem stems from President Reagan, quote unquote, cutting and running after the 1983 Be Beirut Marine Barracks bombing. Yeah, I'm going to keep these relatively short, or at least Danny short. Um, a, a writer who I really respect, Robin Wright, who quoted me in a New Yorker piece uh, months ago. So I'm like loath to criticize but uh intellectual honesty requires that i do 
you know, she knows a lot about Lebanon. Actually, she's one of the smart ones on the issue. And uh, she lived there for a time, just like Clarissa Ward did at CNN. There's a few in the mainstream. But, uh, you know, she fell for this, too, a little bit. And, and, I, and I think it, for her, it was the Trump derangement syndrome, as it is for many smart liberals. Um, and what I mean is what I'm talking about in this third myth, it sort of resurfaced in 2018 uh, when Trump said, that he was going to pull out of Syria, which he didn't, and he was kind of blocked from, and I don't even know if he really meant it. It's hard to say because he ended up staying for the oil. But when Trump said, just said he was going to leave Syria, like our small number of troops in the Syrian civil war that shouldn't be there, have no mission, um, she, one of the good ones, along with a lot of bad ones, started writing that, you know, Trump is making the same mistake as Reagan in like cutting and running from the Middle East and what they were referring to and what they wrote about in their analogy pieces that were mostly very poor is when Reagan left in February of 1984, uh, pulled the 2,500 or so at the peak Marines mostly out of Beirut uh, in the wake of the October, I believe 23rd uh, bombing of the Marines barracks at Beirut airport. Uh, it was the largest non-nuclear explosion since the Second World War. Uh, it was the largest single loss of life in American ter- in a terrorist attack on American targets up to that point in, in, I think, history. And then it was the largest single-day loss of life for the U.S. military since Iwo Jima. So this was a big deal, right? It's often forgotten. It happened just a few months after I was born, right? It was It's 1983. Uh, what is missed, and I'll just keep it very short on this. What's missed in that myth is that um, no one ever talks about why we were there. We were there to pick up the mess. Uh, Reagan administration Republican officials used the phrase that they, the Israelis, left us holding the bag. It's a very simple backstory. Israel invades in 1982. They promised us they would only invade the southern part to like go far enough to make sure missiles can't fall on northern you know, uh, missiles from the Palestinian militias that were there can't fall on northern Israel. They promised us they would not go any further than a certain number of kilometers. They immediately broke that. We immediately did nothing in response. Sounds pretty typical of the way we handle Israel. They went all the way to Beirut. They put it under siege. About 20,000 Lebanese, mostly civilians, most of whom were Shia, because they were the ones that were in the way, because they live in southern Lebanon and southern Beirut, are killed. Uh, shatters Lebanon, which had already been racked by seven years of civil war. And then uh, the United States brokers, we green-lighted the invasion, first of all, but now we broker because there's like international outcry, especially after there was like a kid with both of his arms blown off that was like famously put all over the news. Of course, there were thousands and thousands of other children worse, but this was the image. And so an international settlement is brokered largely by the United States saying like Israel's going to have to pull back from Beirut and uh, that the, the Palestinian liberation organization, Yasser Arafat's crew will like hop on some boats and, and leave Dodge. And that's the settlement we brokered. And in the settlement, it was written that, you know, we had a responsibility uh, the West to send in like a multinational force, which was British, American, French, and Italian, but mostly American and French troops, like a peacekeeping force, early use of peacekeeping, early use of that language even, actually, very fascinating, come in, and what we're going to do is we're just going to, like, separate the warring factions, let the Palestinians retreat on boats, and they're going to go all around the Arab world, mostly to Tunisia, and then Israel back off, and, like, the civilians will be protected, but what was written in the agreement was, like, hey, the Palestinians that stay behind, not the fighters, but their families, that like live there because that's where they live because they're refugees from Israel. They have to be protected. Like that's our responsibility as like the West. Um, and so that happens. It all works out pretty well, actually. And uh, the Marines get back on their boats and the rest of the most of the force leaves. Uh, uh, but like seven days later, the president, Bashir Gamal, that the Israelis had put in charge, he was president elect. He hadn't even been inaugurated. Uh, and then he only got elected because Israel like literally threatened and paid off enough deputies to make it happen. That's fun. Uh, he was assassinated by another Christian. <laughs> Interesting. Tells you some stuff. Uh, anyway, uh, in the process of that, the Christian militias go fucking ape shit, and Israel then responds by 
<laughs> invading West Beirut, which they had been they had promised us they wouldn't do twice. They did it again, and they broke the international agreement that broke with the truce. At which point they surrounded, formed a cordon with their army, including tanks, the two largest uh, Palestinian uh, refugee camps, Sabra and Chatilla. And uh, they then let organized, coordinated, had a joint operations center with the Falange militia. Falange is, uh, is uh, phalanx, like it's the word for phalanx, which is the Greek. Uh, military formation, they're fascists. They are literally fascists. They are formed in, in, in mirroring Mussolini in the 1920s and 30s. Uh, very ironic that Holocaust survivors leading the Israeli army would collaborate with a fascist Christian militia. But they did. They had a joint operation center. They let the Falange militia in, which then massacred from 750 to 2,500, depending on who you believe, uh, Palestinian, mostly men, women, uh, old men, women, and children. Uh, they carved Christian crosses in the chests of many people they killed. Most of the killing was done with knives, although hand grenades were made into necklaces and put around people's necks. And there was a famous phalange militiaman who wore spiked uh, combat boots, which he used to crush infant skulls beyond recognition. It was one of the most horrifying things. Uh, Western reporters were there on the scene pretty quickly. Israel not only didn't do anything about it. This went on for two full days. They actually fired illumination flares for the militiamen, enabling them. And so anyway, their own investigation in basically indicts them for being responsible, which is pretty rare. But after that, Reagan brings the Marines back in. Classic error, sort of, you know, getting them involved in a civil war. They come back in, they take sides as multinational forces tend to do, especially if America's running them. And they end up siding with the Christians largely, and they end up shelling and bombing the Druze and Muslim militias. And in response, Iran and Syria may uh, have had a role in this in the actual execution, but the, uh, the Shia militia that eventually kind of becomes Hezbollah uh, bombs the American embassy, the French military headquarters and the american marine barracks and you know over 300 people are killed total and uh after that despite saying he would stay forever and we don't negotiate with terrorists and we're not going to look weak reagan actually did the right thing and uh and pulled the troops out uh quietly sort of and uh not before he shifted all the blame on the colonel on the ground who had warned him and his administration against getting involved in the civil war because he said if you start firing naval shells at one of the militias they're not stupid they're going to say we're on the christian side and then my guys are going to be a target and you're going to have the blood of a lot of marines on your hand he said that before the bombing and then he was blamed his career was over so reagan did that and then he also invaded granada uh the day after the beirut bombing uh, which was a really great way to distract attention. Bill Clinton learned something about that after Monica Lewinsky. But uh, yeah, that's how that went down. So this whole cut and run narrative misses the fact that the Marines there had essentially no mission quoted. That's a quote from Secretary of Defense Casper Weinberger, not exactly, you know, some sort of like hippie. Uh, he, he didn't want them there, the Marines. And neither did the Joint Chiefs of Staff. They were like, this is a bad mission. Weinberger said, they don't even have a goddamn mission. What are we doing there? They were just a target. Well, it went bad. And uh, so did Reagan cut and run or did he make a series of errors and show the – and this is me saying something nice about Reagan. Oh, my God. So show a rare bit of you know, prudence, whatever his political calculations, and pulling the troops out. I said that was going to be a short answer. It wasn't. It's super interesting, though. <laughs> I mean the subject, not my saying it. Oh, uh, um, and so for the ne next one, it's it essentially just on Iran – uh, quote unquote, did that bombing, and they did it just because Tehran hates America and hates our freedoms. What do you think about that, Danny? This I'll actually be able to do short because I've said a lot of it. Okay, bottom line Hezbollah as an organization doesn't officially exist yet, uh, or there's debate about whether it did. Um, it does seem that Iran, although there's a lot of contested views of this, but it does seem that Iran and Syria, I think there's evidence that's pretty sure that they had some role in it, right? Kind of facilitating this attack. Um, 
but in the but the movement that becomes Hezbollah is grounded in a mall. Most of the fighters of Hezbollah break off of a mall to form this more like stronger resistance to Israel and America and neo imperialism. So they had their there's already Shia grievance, and then this whole idea that they only did it because they hate our freedoms. Even if we assume Iran was fully behind it which I think, again, is questionable. And I think it's more complicated than that because it was, again, grounded in this real Shia uprising that was Lebanese. Hezbollah is Lebanese, folks. They are the, the fighters, the political party members, they are Lebanese. So when guys like Mike Pompeo say, like he said, like a few weeks ago, we want Hezbollah out of Lebanon. Wait, what does that mean? You want to like do a mass transfer of population, like ethnic cleansing? That's illegal under international law. They're Lebanese. We want the Lebanese to leave Lebanon. But anyway, he's an idiot, of course. But the the point is, even if you say like, okay, Iran did it or was involved, let's just say that, right? And I think they did have an involvement. It misunderstands that they did it just because they hate our freedoms, because we at that very moment were backing Saddam Hussein very actively in his extermination war against Iran. It was a war of survival, existential. So they're involved in an eight-year Iran-Iraq war. They're in year four of it. And America's like pushing that, like supporting Saddam Hussein, which is fun. And so they are looking for a way to hit back at America, right? They, they have their reasons. And then Syria facilitates it as well because they're kind of the middleman. And they've always had a strong hand in Lebanon. But the reason that they're doing it is, again, like, I don't love the Assad's. This is Assad's father, Hafez al-Assad at the time. But, you know, Israel had just, like, wiped out their entire air force and killed about 1,500 of their soldiers during the invasion of Lebanon. So, like, they are also involved, right? They, they have their own grievance. And so the bottom line is that there were real reasons that the Shia were angry at America. And they mainly um, – they mainly – rested on the fact that Israel killed about 60 Shia, mostly civilian Lebanese for every Israeli, mostly soldiers, almost all soldiers killed in the invasion. It's about 60 Shia for every one Israeli died in that war, and they were mostly civilians, so they were mad about that. America had green-lighted that invasion. America had then not fulfilled its obligation to protect the people in the Palestinian refugee camps, and, and about a quarter of them actually were Shia in Sabra and Shatila. Uh, and, and then we allowed the Israelis to let the militia in to you know, stomp babies' heads to death. So this idea that there was no grievance is ridiculous. So the point is, yeah, it, it was complicated. Iran and Syria's role was complicated. Uh, it was mainly driven by us taking sides and becoming just another militia in camouflage in their civil war on the Christian side, and that Iran, Syria, and the Shia people had a lot of grievance of their own. So that's ridiculous. And oh, by the way, last point on this, this is really important. Uh, somebody was paying attention to the Israeli siege and bombing of Beirut, and then America's role in, in helping to green light and then facilitate the massacre in the refugee camps. Uh, he was this uh, young Saudi dude in 1982 and three. And, uh, and he wrote or said in a speech, he said, uh, the incidents that affected me directly go back to 1982 and afterward when America allowed Israelis to invade Lebanon with the help of the American sixth fleet. As I watched the destroyed towers in Lebanon, it occurred to me to punish the unjust the same way and to destroy towers in America so that it could taste some of what we are tasting and stop killing our children and women. And the man who said that was Osama bin Laden. So I would say they didn't do it because they hate our freedoms. They did it because they hate our policies. So uh, our next myth here, and you, you've already covered, I, th I think, the majority of it, but that in reference to the bombing that uh, Hezbollah was the direct culprit and to this day remains just another terrorist group. Yeah, so, I mean, I won't even go too much into the culprit uh, aspect. It was kind of an offshoot, uh, this guy, uh, Mugania, who uh, was uh, was really working for Iran a lot, it seems, and he was also involved in the hostage-taking that kind of followed throughout the mid-'80s. Uh, you know, dozens of American and Western hostages were taken. Um, but... You know, Hezbollah, uh, like I said, as it exists today, wasn't really fully formed yet. And uh, so it's not exactly the direct culprit. And most of the people in Hezbollah now, of course, either weren't born or had nothing to do with it. But uh, the more important part is that second clause, you know, remains just another terrorist group. Uh, 
they are on America's State Department terrorist watch list, of course. Um, and uh, after 9-11, you know, folks in the Bush administration, like Richard Armitage, were calling them the A team of terrorism, that Al-Qaeda was the B team. Rumsfeld talked about actually, like, attacking Hezbollah. There was, like, real consideration of it. Um, Israel, of course, is, like, plugging us with all this, like, false intel to show us that Hezbollah is like this transnational terrorist organization. And then uh, Senator uh, Graham from Florida said that there, he said this on the floor of Congress, on the Senate, that there are sleeper cells of Hezbollah in America already, this F-9-11, waiting to attack us, right? A lot of alarmism and a lot of talk that we're going to like wipe Hezbollah off the map in conjunction with the Israelis. Um, And it doesn't happen because we got bogged down in Iraq, kind of saved them in a way although we would have got bogged down in southern Lebanon if we tried, just like Israel did. But, you know, this is important to understand. Uh, this idea that ter- Hezbollah is terrorist at all is, is highly questionable. Uh, they have done terrorist acts, especially early in their organization. But um, in their 18-year, 1982 to 2000 war to eventually successfully, first time an Arab country ever did, force Israel to give up territory of its own volition with military force, uh, they actually stopped doing suicide bombings. They never did as many as they're remembered as of having done. It's a very small number, actually, compared to what the imagination is. But they attacked almost exclusively military targets during that 18-year resistance. They were like a real guerrilla insurgency with real grievance fighting an unjust, illegal occupier under international law. And they almost only attacked Israeli soldiers. Now, they killed nine Israeli civilians in tit-for-tat retaliatory rocket attacks uh, from 1985 to 2000. And of course, thousands of Shia civilians were killed in the retaliations of Israel. So like, who's the terrorist, right? State terror or guerrilla terror? Um, It's a matter of perspective and proportion. But the bottom line is uh, Hezbollah has always been more than a terrorist group. Uh, It's questionable whether they are at all. And they are also for whatever reasons, and I think some of it is genuine and some of it is obviously like anything else for political game. Uh, They're a political party that uh, gets more votes than any other one single party. I'll complicate this in the next myth, but they do. They got 65,000 more votes in 2018, the last general election, than the next single party. And um, that's about 16% of the total cast in Lebanon. So they're a genuine political party. They hold seats in parliament. And they're also a social services, like welfare organization, especially in southern Lebanon and in the urban slum of southern Beirut, which is a lot like Sadr City in Iraq. And so they have hospitals and, you know, literal welfare and uh, all, all kinds of uh, activities that they, that they take part in. So all of this is a complete misunderstanding of what Hezbollah is, an oversimplification, creation of a monolith. And look, I said as a joke in the last line of this myth, I said, you know, per that known Islamist publication, the New York Review of Books, right, which is like the ultimate polite liberal, organi- you know, publication. Uh, there was a profile done on Hezbollah in like 2004, uh, where the author uh, wrote, you know, by emphasizing public works over piety, Hezbollah has succeeded in embedding itself deep into Lebanese society, a fact that anyone seeking to confront its military wing will have to face. So, yes, they're way more than just a terrorist organization. All right, next one is Iran and Syria were slash are Hezbollah's real puppet masters. Yeah, this one I've talked a lot about already. Just, you know, as we go through, I think some of my answers will end up being able to be shorter. Uh, The bottom line is that Israel actually created Hezbollah. Iran and Syria may have facilitated it in a logistical sense, right? The nuts and bolts, they were there at the formation, but the grievance preceded it. Uh, and don't take my word for it, uh, Prime Minister Ehud Barak, who I believe was the most decorated soldier in Israel living at the time in their military history, <laughs> uh, and former Prime Minister, in 2006, he admitted, when we entered Lebanon, meaning in 1978 and then again in 1982, when we entered Lebanon, there was no Hezbollah. We were accepted with perfumed rice and flowers by the Shia in the south, and it was our presence there that created Hezbollah. And I said that sequence like grievances matter. And so the point is, the grievances of a Shia uprising preceded Iran even having their 1979 revolution. 
because Israel's first invasion was 78. And then, like I said, Musa Sadr had been already kind of like politicizing and harnessing the power of Shia grievance and disenfranchisement since the early 70s. So, you know, to say that it's an Iranian and a Syrian creation and that they're the real puppet masters and the only puppet masters is to actually deny agency and humanity to the Shia people who are so mistreated and are still the poorest and least educated community. So, yeah, this is, this is, this is sort of ridiculous. And there's just a couple of things that I talk about to show like that there's, there's more to it than this. I mean, first of all, why, if, if this is just a Shia thing, run from Tehran. Why then after Nasrallah beats the shit out of, or at least bloodies, the Israelis in the 2006 33-day war when they invaded Lebanon again, why is the Secretary General of, you know, Hezbollah, Nasrallah, still the Secretary General, why, why has he become the most popular world leader in, major, in, in, in an array of polls in the entire Middle East? I mean, 86 to 89% of the Middle East is Sunni. This guy is the, the, the head of one of the most Shia theoretically organizations in the Middle East, and he's the most popular guy because he fought Israel. So first of all, it's more than just Iran behind it. There's real grievance across the Arab world. And then the other thing to keep in mind is like, hold on a second. You know, Syria and Iran didn't even always agree in, in the Lebanese civil war. And actually... Their different proxies, Syria is more, more supports Amal and Iran more supports Hezbollah, fought wars against each other. Uh, they've argued, they've collaborated as well, but it's like way more complicated than this idea that it's just them running it. And if Iran and Syria disappeared tomorrow, believe you me, Hezbollah would remain. And even if it were to change names or morph, the Shia militant resistance culture generated in grievance against the Lebanese state, but also mainly against the West, right? So Israeli and American aggression would continue to exist. So uh, again, don't, don't infantilize the Lebanese Shia. They have real grievance and humanity. Um, this next one may be, be a little redundant, but I'll go ahead and, uh, I'll go ahead and read it. Um, on Tehran slash Damascus's behalf, Hezbollah has hijacked and runs the Lebanese state. Yeah, and this, this is the big reporting after the bombing, or I'm sorry, the bomb. <laughs> Trump called it a bombing the first night of the explosion, like without any evidence. I love him. I love, he is literally the conspiracy theory and theorist in chief. He's QAnon in chief. Like, I love it. Um, but after the explosion, there's been a slew of articles that I quoted in a recent Lebanon piece um, from a variety of outlets in the Gulf Israel and then Western media saying like, now's the chance to kick Hezbollah out, right? And Pompeo said the same thing. Uh, and the theory is, you know, like a, um, like a fellow at a uh, important uh, think tank in DC, the Arab Center said, you know, Hezbollah has been, in, this is 2017, Hezbollah has been in control of the Lebanese state for quite a while now. And it's a supposed victory. It's the victory of Syria and their civil war only strengthens that. And so the idea is, you know, Hezbollah actually runs Lebanon. It's hijacked it. That's the phrase you hear a lot. Um, and then, of course, they're doing it, as we said, I'm not even going to go into that, on Iran and Syria's behalf. But this is the flip side of the thing I told you. So one needs to be able to hold two ideas in their head at the same time. Uh, yes, Hezbollah, more than any single political party, gets more votes these days than anyone else, 16%. But it's still only 16%. And, and almost an equal number right? A nearly equal number of Shia don't support Hezbollah, they support Amal. And so, yes, they're in a coalition now, but they've, they've killed each other before. They argue, they don't always agree. Amal kind of collaborated with the Israelis in the last invasion in 06 against Hezbollah, as WikiLeaks showed us. Um, so Hezbollah does not control the Lebanese state. They do have a very powerful militia that could challenge the Lebanese state. That's real things to talk about there but the bottom line is uh this gets back to there being real shia grievance uh this gets back to the fact that hezbollah yes they are a political party yes they are a social welfare organization but they're just one player in a coalition uh they don't run the lebanese state and as powerful as their militia is america has pumped a lot of money uh, a lot of money into the uh, lebanese army two billion dollars right since 2006 
uh, special forces training, all that security force assistance. So, you know, there's a lot more to this. And uh, if they had hijacked the state on Iran's behalf, one would assume then that they would have created an ISIS-like Shia Islamic state. And while their initial charter said that it was their goal, they gave that up a long, long time ago for two reasons. Uh, one, they actually do have this kind of there is no compulsion in religion thing. Uh, the Lebanese people have always been a, a more tolerant brand of Muslim for the most part than, than even other parts of the region. Uh, and then the Shia just weren't having it. I mean, by some polls, like only 16% of Shia supported an Islamic state, even in like Southern Lebanon, which is the most conservative area. So Hezbollah has to work in the world as it is. So they haven't hijacked Lebanon and turned it into an Islamic state. In fact, Nasrallah said uh, in 2000 or 2004 that we believe the requirement for an Islamic state is to have an overwhelming popular desire. And we're not talking about 51 percent here, he said, but a large majority. And this is not available in Lebanon and probably never will be. That's a pretty like realistic dude. Right. I mean, this is a this is an area in, in Lebanon, especially even in southern Lebanon and South Beirut, where like some of the Shia, they they literally decorate their houses with Christmas trees at Christmas. This is, you know, there's a lot of cross confessional culture. So, yeah, no, they have not hijacked the state. They are powerful. There are important questions about whether their militia should be disarmed at some point. But here's the fact, folks, it ain't going to disarm so long as Israel is aggressive across the border. And uh we just have to understand that that part of the reason that Hezbollah is important and has so much support is because they are seen as a, a, the primary resistance and the only successful, and really in the Arab world ever, resistance to Israel. So it's it's ridiculous. All right, next one we got. By way of Iran slash Syria, there are hidden Russian slash Chinese hands at work in Lebanon. Yeah, it's like another popular one, and it's all tied together, as you can see. Um, look, in America, everything's about us, and everything in the Middle East is about our tussle, our, 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 our sort of beef with the Iranians. And then worldwide, everything, especially since Trump, but always, is about Russia and China. And so... The idea is that if Iran controls Lebanon, Russia controls Iran, and to a lesser extent, China does. Uh, so really, we have to be involved in Lebanon in order to like get Hezbollah out because all they really are is like sort of a um, like a wedge inside the state uh, on Russia's behalf. And uh, I, I attack this across the board by showing that, look, Reagan fell for this. Reagan tried to tell us that the reason the Marines were in Beirut was because it was part of the Cold War and like countering Russia. That clearly was proven untrue. Um, the, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot more to this as well. Like the connection between Russia and Iran is, is largely one of convenience. They have a very dark history. Russia's invaded Iran a number of times, fought a number of wars against the Persians, took land from them. They're, they're really, they're, they're friends because we've made them both enemies, right? We've demonized them so much that we've thrown them into each other's arms. And, you know, this idea that Russia and China run Lebanon is belied not just by that, but also, how about us? Like, for throughout our history, the West, France, America, and Israel, we've hijacked the state on behalf of the Christians a number of times, or at least imposed our influence as patrons. And the Saudis kind of back and have tried to control the Sunni element, which we haven't talked a whole lot about. So there's, and all the other Gulf states. And so like, in other words, everybody is picking at the carcass of Lebanon, not just Russia. In fact, Russia's hand is more veiled and weaker largely than America's, Saudi Arabia's and Israelis. So, uh, which I like to call the actual axis of evil largely, or at least an equal axis of evil in the Middle East. All right, so next one. The antidote to Lebanon's ills was the assassinated ex-Prime Minister Rafiq Hariri. His son Saeed, op, uh, Saeed's opposition bloc remains the country's great Western hope. 
Right. Yeah, let's say the great white hope. Uh, Lebanese people are, are, are traditionally fairer skinned than uh, certain other Arabs, so maybe it is appropriate, uh, the great white hope. Uh, now, the interesting thing there is uh, Hariri uh, and his father, they are one of the six families, the Hariri family, one of the mob families that runs that runs Lebanon. Um, this is the Sunni bloc. This is the future movement, which is the main uh, political coalition of the Sunnis. Uh, very connected to Saudi Arabia. The myth here is that they, more more recently, because during the civil war, the Sunnis were, were actually very pro-Syrian and um, very anti-West and anti-Christian. They like fought each other a whole lot. But uh, in recent years, uh, the Sunni bloc, for a number of reasons, has kind of turned on Syria and therefore we think turned on Iran and turned on Hezbollah. And so now suddenly we've said like, they're the modern... Muslim natural ally of America, right? They're the, the pro-Western. And like every lie, there's some truth in it, right? Like every sort of myth, there's some truth in it. Like the Hariris are a fairly like modern family and some of the, the urban Sunni middle class, the extent that one still exists in poor Lebanon, uh, are a little more, I guess, pro-Western, but they're anti-Israel or anti-Israel policy. They're anti-American support for Israel, their alliance with the West is much more uh, opportunistic than deeply felt. And the thing to keep in mind is that the idea that this is like the great hope is undercut by just how corrupt the Hariri family is. And so, yes, Syria and Hezbollah may have played a role in assassinating Rafiq Hariri, the father of the current son running the block, Saeed, who may come back as prime minister, it looks like, for his third try. These are highly corrupt people. They made billions of dollars running Saudi construction and like conglomerate companies. Um, Saeed has about $1.5 billion. He was the head of a Saudi uh, company. I mean, literally after the Civil War, they got all the contracts to rebuild Beirut. Like, you cannot make this shit up. It's like some Trump 80s Atlantic City of mafia shit, except way more intense. Hmm. Um, when he was prime minister, there was a big scandal because Saeed, I think he paid $16 million in like, I don't know, hush money or just a gift to a escort slash energy drink spokeswoman slash model in South Africa, white South African, um, just married man with many kids, like just total scandal, corruption ridden uh, in the streets right now. The protesters in Lebanon are saying all means all, meaning like all of them means all of them. Like we're not omitting anyone, even our own sect from the corruption charges about how much we hate our government. I mean, they're literally hanging everyone in effigy in the streets. I think they built a guillotine the other day, which I'm totally in favor of. I love that old school shit. And they do have a French connection in Lebanon. So anyway, the bottom line is um, the Sunnis uh, uh, in Hariri's party uh, are fundamentally Lebanese and they uh, are constantly changing sides. They are very much in the Saudi camp, but not completely. Um, they they are not a monolith, just like all the other communities. They're divided amongst themselves, and they are not the future of Lebanon. There is nothing so simple as that. This is a country full of nuance, and they most certainly aren't just purely pro-American because they love our freedom as the antidote to the Iranians and the Hezbollah hating our freedoms. They, uh, they actually abhor a lot of American policy in the region. And uh, these are corrupt guys, just like everybody else in Lebanon who runs the country. All right, last one. Lebanon's system can be reformed if the U.S. backs the pro-Western good guys and opposes the Iranian-directed bad guys. Yeah, not much to say about this. It's very similar to number nine and some of the other point points. Uh, the bottom line is that uh, the best thing America could do is kind of just give aid to a floundering country with no strings attached and stop trying to control Lebanon. It will be the end of us. It won't work. It never works. <laughs> Israel learned that several times. Uh, collapsed. Two of their governments collapsed in the wake of cat catastrophic ill-advised interventions in Lebanon. Sharon, 
was kicked out of government first as prime uh, defense minister and as prime minister. America has come to grief. Israel has come to grief. France has come to grief. Every time they tried to control Lebanon, let the Iranians and the Russians and the Syrians come to grief. Let them get muddled, muddled in there is my take. But there aren't pure pro-Western good guys and pure Iranian-directed bad guys. There is a mix. This gets back to the idea that, you know, Christians – often support Hezbollah politically. Uh, half the Christians, or about 30 to 40 percent of the Christians, the Christian minority is tacitly allied with the pro-Western vague bloc, but even they don't love American policy mostly. The other half or more of the Christians actually are closer to Syria and, you know, tied to the Shia parties like Hezbollah and Amal. Um, all of these Crime families are just that. They're crime families. They're not the last, last best hope. And, um, you know, when America tries to tighten sanctions like on Hezbollah in Lebanon, it ends up hurting all the Lebanese. And so even the great white hope of Hariri and his son have opposed that. The clergy, the patriarch, right, uh, of the Maronite church Christians has spoken in favor of Hezbollah and its resistance against Israel. Uh, these people are not pro-Western good guys, and the Hezbollah and the Shia are not anti-Western bad guys. It's shades of gray. It always is. And uh, we have sold out our quote-unquote friends in Lebanon so many times before that to expect them to trust us is ludicrous. I mean, all you need to know is that the current president, Michel Aoun, uh, used to be prime minister at the end of the Civil War. He was a fierce nationalist. Unlike most Civil War leaders, he actually had more than just Christians behind him. And he waged a hopeless, I think he knew, War of Liberation, it was called, from 88 to 90 at the end of the Civil War against Syria to try to kick the Syrians out of their country, which you think we would like, right? But, well, in 1990, this guy named Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, and in order for our uh, war against him not to look like a new crusade that was going to alienate all the Muslims, we needed to get a bunch of like Muslim countries on our side to fight Saddam. And so in order to get serious support in that coalition, which they did eventually join, and they were our allies, people forget that, we gave them, we sold out the current president of Lebanon. We sold Michelle out and uh, we, uh, we let the Syrians bombard and kill his men and, you know, basically surround him in his palace until he had to go into exile for 15 years in France. So now he's in charge of a, actually, he's kind of flipped and become a little more pro Syrian because he's a savvy actor and he has to survive politically. And, uh, you know, to expect that the Christian community is just going to forgive us for that and think that we're on their side is ridiculous. And I'll just end with, like, I think he said it best, the current president of Lebanon, right after we sold him out. 40 years ago, he said and was quoted, I believe, in the New York Times saying, the United States does not care about Lebanon. It has sold Lebanon. When it says it is moved by our tragedies, it is lying. Man. He could have been saying that about the way we responded to this explosion at the port, but he said that shit 40 years ago. And that's it. That's our 10 minutes. <laughs> I could do 20 more, but I've already taken over an hour doing this. <laughs> Seems like a great place to end, man. Absolutely. Let me just say that uh, keep watching Lebanon by the time listeners are listening to this. Uh, may, more things may unfold, but uh, Israel did – uh, about, I guess we're talking like the 25th ish, 24th to 25th of August, they, uh, a few days before we recorded this, they uh, bombed Hezbollah positions uh, in southern Lebanon. Again, saying that uh, Hezbollah had fired as their troops over the border. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but it uh, feels kind of convenient, doesn't it, that, uh, that Israel would say that in the wake of this blast and all these calls that now is the chance, like some headlines, but now is the opportunity to get Hezbollah out of. Lebanon. Um, and so the fact that they would kind of use this like minor border incident to uh, bomb, you know, like Hezbollah, like OPs and radar positions uh, is uh, it feels a little too convenient and uh, keep an eye on Lebanon. But remember that if Israel does invade or get bogged down again, 
Uh, it will be the end of them. This has never ended well for Israel. And uh, it'll end up backfiring, and it'll end up actually empowering the anti-Western and anti-Israeli forces, uh, including in the Christian community. So uh, keep an eye on Lebanon. History tends to repeat itself there, as it does everywhere. But uh, it's repeated itself so many times in Lebanon that, as Mark said, the second time it repeats is farce. Well, I don't know what you even call it when it repeats itself 20 times, but it definitely uh, probably leans towards absurdity. So, hey, th thanks for letting me uh, do this, Henry. And uh, hopefully for the listeners, uh, you learned something uh, about Lebanon and didn't tune out from my rants. But AnnieWar.com, I've got four pieces already on Lebanon. There's more coming. And uh, keep an eye on this little country because it is the bellwether uh, and the battlefield and the bastard child, as I said, of the Middle East. Oh, yeah, no, I, I I learned a ton, both from reading your pieces and then going through them now. Um, so I'm, I'm sure the listeners are, have gotten a, a great introduction to all of the the our collective history with Lebanon and, and where it is going in the future, which, if, if it continues, like you're talking about with Israel and such, that it's just going to be bad for the Lebanese, whatever way it happens to turn. Absolutely, yep. Yeah crazy country very interesting uh i think uh it was quoted in an article recently saying that uh you know someone who was a reporter in lebanon for a lot of years said that if you if you if you really know lebanon and you've lived there uh and you don't fall in love with it and you also don't realize that it's an awful place and you don't hold both those ideas in your head at the same time then you're probably not paying attention mm. we're on twitter at fortress on a hill and also at facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not detain.